the Radical Secular Podcast, a demand for justice, equality, and rational public policy. Subscribe at YouTube, Apple Podcasts and all the major podcast channels. Visit our website at theradicalsecular.com for articles, insights, and our complete library of episodes. Support us on Patreon and follow us on social media. Hello, and welcome back to the Radical Secular Podcast. I'm Joe Kipinti. I'm Christoph Defoe. And I'm Sean Prophet. I don't know about you, but it's sure been a challenge to be hopeful these days and these <laughs> last years. I always thought of myself as an optimistic person. To be honest, I've been struggling with how to personally and emotionally navigate this moment. There seems to be so much at play, and all these things could totally impact our lives. We have named and discussed many of these crises here on this show, and now I think it's time to look a bit within. If you're like me and understand the dire circumstances that surround us, the challenge is to persevere and to stay focused on justice. Certainly we should not revert to a Pollyannic attitude about it. We should not dismiss the dire happenings and the potentialities that we all face. Yet at the same time, I believe it is possible to face the truth of our times and still live a rich life as well as one of service. Later in the show, we'll be talking about a film called For Sama that documents the Syrian war from the perspective of non-combatants, primarily from the view of a young woman struggling to keep herself and her family sane and alive, who is filming the happenings of, around her. The movie has won many awards, and rightly so. Uh, you, you both have seen it and probably agree with that. It's one of the most powerful documentaries I've experienced in my life, and I've seen many of them. I include this film here because it does speak to the crisis and it speaks to crisis in general and resilience in that crisis in a truly profound way. But first, I want to remind you all that if you like our show, make sure to subscribe, leave a review and check our Patreon page and tell your friends to listen. New episodes post Mondays at noon Eastern on YouTube and all the major podcast channels. We also publish new articles regularly in our journal at theradicalsecular.com. The Radical Secular Podcast is brought to you by Cannibal & Co. Located in downtown Jersey City and at shopcannibal.com. Cannibal, that's Cannibal with a K, stocks a rotating collection of goods ranging from apparel and accessories to home furnishings and fine jewelry. Cannibal weaves together its forward-thinking vision with its traditional roots to provide an expertly curated experience of unique and locally sourced finds. We're grateful to Cannibal for sponsoring our show. All right, let's kick right off with our T-shirts. Gentlemen, what do you got? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm glad to be here. This is a really important topic to me, uh, how we persevere. And I think for me, more than anything else, it comes down to uh, maintaining hope. And I'm wearing my one of my Star Trek shirts today, just the classic um, Delta logo. Um, oh, um, nice. And nice. Yeah. And, and I think that's actually the discovery one, but nevertheless, um, and, and again, I think that the values of the Federation of Planet, right, uh, uh, are what motivate me. And that might sound silly, right? Because it's a TV show and whatever, but we talk about it on, on this show all the time that these values of tolerance and the values of, 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 of investigativeness of, of, um, of truth. Um, of commitment to the scientific method, right? These things are, are so important and so paramount. And, and, you know, when I'm down in the dumps, watching an episode of, uh, Star Trek can really pull me up, honestly, and, and, and help me refocus yeah. on something, on something different instead of looking at so much at the problem to be looking at what the future may hold or what the, or what the, uh, what the solutions might be. And it's not easy. It's hard. And we're going to talk more about that, but uh, yeah. that's what I'm wearing this shirt for today. Well, I think that's really well said. And I think that we have to, recognize that in all situations of crisis, art and literature and music and mm. these things continue and have mm -hmm. always continued and have always been what people have used to sort of hold on to uh, hope and really to, to give their lives meaning. And I, I kind of went the other way because, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, a situation of, of war. And of course, war is always based on deception. Mm. And so I went with 1984. War is peace. 
Freedom is nice. slavery and ignorance is strength. Yeah. So, and, um, <laughs> you know, it really it's is. like we see what we see this going on right now. We see that the first opening salvos in uh, what may become a, a, a shooting war in Ukraine are, in fact, uh, all this talk of false flags, cyber attacks, yep. and and all kinds of deception that is the essence of warfare. And so I think we're going to talk about that documentary really makes that clear. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to to covering all that. Yeah, me too. I'm glad to have you guys both here with me. This is going to be a good conversation. Now, my T-shirt is just basically my human T-shirt, because I love this T-shirt. Because nice. it doesn't, it really just speaks for itself. You know, we are really talking about the human condition in all these different ways for us, for ourselves, for life, for the war. And this show is really about that in a really, you know, central way. So, anyway, I think that's pretty much it. I did want to say one thing about Discovery. You mentioned Discovery. That show mm. is really hitting its prime. I mean, it's Ooh, so good. Isn't it, though? And, oh, and, boy. And what I, what I really like about it, this the last season in particular, is that it's gone back to the philosophy of hope and perseverance and looking forward and progress. Because mm -hmm. it, it was really cloak and daggerish and dark in the beginning. You know, yes. the show has changed. All of a sudden, it just lit up. And I'm, I'm so happy for that. I agree. I, and I wonder, I, I, and I wonder if how you guys think about this. And by the way, Sean, I almost wore a 1984 shirt today too. So that would have been <laughs> interesting if that were, if that had worked out. <laughs> um, yeah. That was like my other choice, which is funny. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, I do love, I, it makes me wonder, did Discovery, did the showrunners and the writers, was this always where they were going with this, right? Like when yeah. they started with the mirror universe and all this, I, mean, I get it. They were trying to anchor themselves in Star Trek lore and that was really important. Right. And I'm glad they did do that. Um, but I wonder, right. Was this always the direction where, where they suddenly like, Oh my God, now we found the formula. Um, I suspect it's probably the latter, right? Because right. The first two episodes, the first two seasons of pretty much every Star Trek show are mediocre, right? Some of them are, True. some of them are better you're, than others. You're right about you know, that. But, yeah. So I wonder. I wonder. Yeah. I, I don't know how to answer that, but I wonder. I, I liked course, all of the Discovery episodes. I mean, I liked it from the beginning, too. and I thought that the I thought that the darkness of the first couple of seasons was really good because it was disorienting. I mean, we had to was. find you know what 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 is the place for the Federation in this future where mm. you know space travel has been curtailed and um you know it, it looked it seemed like. The, the the beauty of Star Trek was always that we had a destination, that we could get through all of our troubles and we could arrive somewhere, a 24th century right. where you know mm. there's no money, everybody has what they need, blah, blah, blah. But then these guys went beyond that in discovery to the 31st or whatever century that it, that it is and uh, to a point of new desolation and new breakdown and mm. new crisis. And I mm -hmm. thought that was really effective. I think that is, Sean, and I think it's particularly effective, right, because everything we watch on TV, but Star Trek in particular, reflects the mood of the era in which it's created, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and we are, we're going to talk a little bit about this as well, right? We're at this place where it feels like we're going backwards, right? It feels like yeah. we made it so far. And there was a, a time when, uh, when people really cared about freedom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it feels at least at very much, it feels like we're going backward. And, um, and so, and we are in a new place of desolation, right? So, yeah. um, and what Saru says, it's our job to make this future bright, right? He said that mm -hmm. in season four when they first, or season three when they first arrived in the future. And that's exactly it, right? Yeah. I kind of think that that is at least, I think that that's how we, like, we can think about how we contribute to yeah. the, uh, the the world right now when it feels like it's in shambles. Good point, yeah. And let me start with something hopeful here. Krista, I think you're absolutely right that the shows do reflect the moments of our times. And what's amazing about discoveries, how incredibly diverse the cast is, right? Mm, and yeah, like how it. so multicultural in the true sense of the word, word, word. And that is a reflection of our times, too. Let's not forget that, mm. right? Yeah. Is that, is mm -hmm. we, so, there's, there's a lot a good of point. good shit here, right? Right. So, it's a good point. Anyhow, I want to begin um, with a kind of difficult and personal question for each of you today. Uh, first, how should we feel? Is it hype to say we are living in unprecedented times? What have 
been for you the most distressing and pessimistic happenings of these times? What keeps you up at night most of all? Uh, and what things really hurt and have challenged your strength and your courage? Mm. Man, Either tough of you questions. <laughs> tough <laughs> questions, man. Uh, and look, I, I let's put it this way. Democracy is in decline. And uh, and I think that's inescapable, right? Uh, it's very scary. I grew up with a certain idea of what America was and the rise of Trumpism and the normalization of racism and the voter suppression has really shattered all of that. Uh, and, and mass communication technologies like Facebook, as well as the global, now the global scope of humanity's capacity to destroy itself is definitely unprecedented, right? That stuff is brand new. Uh, still though, when we broaden the perspective, it's, it's, we can remember that the story of human existence is a story generally of brutal injustice. That is the story, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a democracy and freedom we've enjoyed recently that's unusual, not our current slide toward despotism. Yeah. So, so yes, civilization is in dire straits, but there always has been injustice. So let's stop being surprised by it, right? I, that's why this is my problem with the sky is falling outlook. I think it robbed us of hope. And without hope, we easily become just passive observers of a system we feel powerless to change. And what's worse is that we tend to infect others with that sense of hopelessness. And then we don't create the solidarity we need to create the change we need. Um, and I'll talk a little more later about what I think progressives should be doing. But that is sort of my initial thought mm -hmm. when I when I read the prompt. OK, Sean. Yeah, well, I, I certainly concur. And it's interesting because conservatives say the same thing <laughs> when we were when we were reading uh the charles murray book for our episode that we did about that uh he was saying the same thing about why mm. why it was so important to save this the, the republic you know <laughs> because mm. america is this grand experiment right and of course when you're talking about con to conservatives they are talking about my, the Constitution as protecting minority rule. Now, this is something that they don't want really to be said openly. And as a matter of fact, there are places in the U.S. right now who have passed where they've passed laws against teaching that the U.S. was founded on white supremacy when, in fact, it was. I mean, yeah. the, the yep. we've talked about this many times on the show about the three fifths compromise and the malapportionment that resulted from that. And we've also, you know, talked just so much about about how the Constitution just baked in this white male supremacy into into our nation. And conservatives are seeing that as under threat, just as we are seeing civil rights under threat. And because mm. their concept of what rights are is very different from from ours. Yeah. They be, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, all the things we've discussed many times, the hierarchy, the way things ought to be that they think, you know, according to Western civilization, going all the way back to Greece and Rome, they claim that for themselves. Uh, they they minimize <laughs> what the contributions that have come out of the Middle East and Africa to civilization and China, by the way. Mm -hmm. right? And so they've got a very narrow view to them. World history only exists for you know, the 18% or whatever of the world that's <laughs> Caucasian. And so this, this is, this is the struggle. And it's something that, um, we all have to recognize that if we're, if, if, if we think that the future is going to be better than the past, it's because we, th we see it moving towards equality, but other people see that as a threat. And so that's, you know, that's you know, the tough part. Yeah. I, I, just, think that's I right. want to say something, one thing about Western civilization. I just can't help it. Okay. I just want <laughs> people to realize, and this is really clear in history, right? Europe was a fucking basket case in a miserable place for most of its history. Why is there right. a diaspora? <laughs> from Europe. Why did all Europeans <laughs> flee, right? Mil yeah. Tens of millions. Because Europe was a horrible, horrible place for a lot of people, unless you were wealthy and powerful. And so exactly. like, that's Western civilization too, boys. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. And for that matter, you know, Rome was collapsing for hundreds of years and there was chaos during that yeah. collapse, I right? Mean, so it's right. like there hasn't been a time that is like a lot of people imagine. Right. And that, that's a great point, Sean and Joe. And right, because this whole idea of conservatism is that there was a time when everything was great. Right. That is one of the fundamental one of the sort of pillars of conservative thought is that there was some 
some Pollyannish idea of, 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 of uh, ideal sometime in the past that we should be working back toward and liberals have screwed right. that up, Good you point. know, and, 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 uh, you know what? Also, I've been reading this book, um, the dawn of everything mm. and it is so good and so long but it's so good <laughs> um but one of the things that it does is challenge a lot of the assumptions that about west that west that we in western civilization have made about the contributions of western civilization how people were and most importantly the inevitability this idea that where we are right now is inevitable right you go from this to that to this to that and that and that's how we got here and and that narrative so frequently leaves out um the influence of of, of power and hierarchy and the things that we tend to talk about on this show so um Yes, absolutely. Uh, good, points, good. Bo- good points, both of you yeah. guys. Yeah, speaking of that book, I think we're going to be doing a show, at least probably a couple of shows on it. I know mm, I've yeah. invited my wife to do, to do the part on human origin. There's a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of false narratives about our prehistory, and which feed our ideologies today. And, and, and totally. we need to challenge those things. And I think... Uh, she's an anthropologist. She, she knows a great deal about this stuff. In fact, we we're w- listening to this, to the book together and she's like telling me things before the guy in the book says them. I'm like, oh, yeah, awesome. you know your shit, baby. <laughs> <I'm> like, yeah, <laughs> that's going to be a great show. I can't wait. I can't wait to, to have her on. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Any- That'll be great. Anyway, uh, yeah, and then we'll, and then Chris, after the part about Europe, I think we need to we could do a whole show on that too. I mean, oh, from yes, that book, definitely. yeah, that's fascinating, right? Because it just undermines the this entire idea that we've talked about. The entire underlying premise of colonialism is that is that what that is that European civilization is worth exporting, right? Mm-hmm. But you look back and it's like, yeah, it's well w- w- worth exporting if you are a what we would now consider a neoliberal, right? Basically, yeah. going into a place and extracting resources, right? I mean, that's and, and and making money off of that, then yeah, that was a great system. Yeah. But for like everybody else, it was a terrible way well, to live. And it's they, they're they're like we have to go and organize these savages. I mean, that was the entire right. impulse, right? And and and, <laughs> right. and and the the pretense was like we're doing it for these people while oh you're God, robbing absolutely. those people, you know. So uh, it's yeah. just yeah. The, the the stories. Just the more you read it, I think that's. I didn't really answer the question about you know what has challenged oh, yeah, yeah. my ahead, strength yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. What it is is I think I'm constantly having these arguments in my head with neoliberal type, you know, conservative type people, people who believe in the hierarchy. And I think I just, um, I can't get them out of my head. That's the hardest thing for me. And mm. be- because we can't even get past square one in having these conversations. If someone believes that hierarchy imposed hierarchy, unearned hierarchy is a good thing. And so many yeah. people believe that. And that is the struggle for me, I think, is is having people who, you know, I h- have a relationship with friendship, family, whatever, who can t- continue to maintain that narrative and continue to uh, support all the suffering that, that entails. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. that's really, really tough for me. And I find myself, you know, sometimes lying awake at night thinking about it and thinking about, you know, it's really a choice of what kind of a world do we want? We could have it all, but... There are some people who just don't want it. They, they believe that, uh, justice and, and, uh, prosperity and all of those things for everyone is a threat. And yeah. that's been the hardest that's struggle right. for me is coming to terms with that mentality and not thinking that those people are sociopaths. Yeah. I, yeah and I, I Christoph, do you find that. a similar challenge with that? Oh, I do. I do. I do. That is, that's really hard. I mean, I think that. Uh, there are certain folks that I just sort of write off, right? Um, but there are definitely people and let me put it this way. I think a good way to, 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 to crystallize what I'm trying to say is dealing with friends of mine who are religious, uh, not maybe super religious, but you know, they don't, but maybe right. they're, they're certainly not anyone who's going to be friends with me is probably not like a practicing Catholic who goes to church every week, um, or is, or, 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 or is a formal religious person, formal religion person in general. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but they may believe in God. They may believe in X, Y, and Z. And a lot of people, even if they don't believe in God explicitly, they don't, they're not, they're not materialists, right? They're like, like, there's vanishingly few people who are like straight up materialists. So not my many, point no. is that, <laughs> the, right? Um, my my point is that these are folks who are on my side, 
right? They believe all most of everything that I believe, right? But yeah. what I but the but there's, the fundamental problem is that how do you tell somebody that like the way that you've structured your way of seeing of the world, the way that you structured your thinking is maybe flawed, right? Maybe the whole idea of God is itself this built in hierarchy that is standing in the way of progress, right? Right. How do you have a conversation with somebody that I love, yeah. care about, who's a friend? Um, and, and, and that has been hard. I mean, what it's, what, it, what it's meant for me is, being prepared to hold two disparate ideas in my head at the same time. And that's uncomfortable, right? That sure. this person is an idiot in this way, right? <laughs> and they're fucking wrong. And I know that. But also, right, like they agree with me on 90, not, maybe not even 90, maybe it's 75 or 80% of the, of the things and all the major issues they definitely agree with me on, right? They're out there with Black Lives Matter signs. They're, right, they're out there doing this stuff. But at the same time, they harbor these really terrible ideas. I think that's hard. I think it's hard to hold those, both of those ideas in your head at the same yeah, time. Good. Yeah, I, well taken. Uh, I, I, I have a similar, frustration with all that in fact mm. i find it even harder to deal with not so much the real like right wing alt right you know advocates and crazy people that talk about but like people who you know are thoughtful intelligent people generally nice people but they just are just repeating these terrible terrible ideas yes. and notions i mean like or just aren't really able to to think things through not that they're not capable of it but they've just been told things over and over again like you know, I was having this conversation with someone I think is a really, really, you know, top person, but they were, they were talking about, you know, well, you know, we don't have any right to, to criticize Russia for what they, they, they're doing because we do the <laughs> same thing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, but think about what you're saying. I mean, okay, I don't have any right to, to criticize that guy for murdering someone because he also murdered someone. I mean, like, right. right. And, you know, what's also, really funny. <laughs> what's really funny about that? I have to interrupt real yeah, quick, Joe. Ahead. Um, <laughs> The left used to do this with, when it was the Soviet Union, right? The left used to used to mm -hmm. say use whataboutism, yes. and and yes. you know talking about because uh, it was if the Russians attacked somebody if they started a war somewhere it's like well the U.S. has started all kinds of wars you know and we're not you know we we flipped sides because that's turned into an authoritarian uh, state now instead of a, a of a communist or socialist state. We, we find the right making that same argument. I mean, that's Ted Cruz and Tucker mm -hmm. Carlson have made that argument yeah, repeatedly. Yeah, yeah that's Which a, is an a astonishing argument to make yeah. from an America first crowd. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Here you are defending Russia. How, how backwards have you gotten that you are now, right? That you are, you are attacking America to defend Russia. You're yeah. saying, right? right yeah, like what? <laughs> well, to be able to hold these thoughts in your mind at the same time that, yes, the United States has done a lot of wrongs, but at the same time, Russia is really a bad actor and not to, you know, just to conf conflate some weird, you know, comparison between the two. It's like you just have to look at the world and, and you know, analyze things as they are and treat things as they are. You know, everything's nuanced about, about this stuff. And yes, America has done a lot of, tr a lot, a lot of wrongs in this regard, but it doesn't, ju it doesn't give people the right to excuse wrongs that are being done now. That's hurting exactly. people. That's killing people. That's causing so much suffering. And, and honestly true. It's also true that America has also done some good things in the world and has, managed to actually keep its power in check in many ways that other countries have not. And so you have to look at all of that objectively and dispassionately and not just jump to these like truisms, you know, that are not true mm -hmm. at all. Uh, we have to look at the good and the bad. We have to assess all of it. Well, it's interesting that um, we've had a major, major realignment in the world uh, from sort of the UN backed international order that used to be that was you know that that NATO was the was kind of the backbone of mm. and then we let Russia in you know uh at a certain point to the G7 and became the G8 and you know there was this attempt to sort of integrate Russia and China into this world order and uh, there was opposition from hardliners on all sides of this mm -hmm. because yeah. these are the nationalists, the people who want tensions, who want a multipolar world, who want this, this kind of, uh, mercantilism, who want, um, 
you know, balance of power theory as opposed to internationalism. And we're seeing right. a lot of that too. And if you think about, like, <laughs> if you um, are mad at the U.S. for some of the bad things that it's done, if you think about a world without the U.S. in it that was run by Russia, China, and oh. whoever else, like, can you that's even right. imagine what that world would look <laughs> like? That's oh right. Oh my God. That's oh right. Oh my God. Like, can you imagine? That's, that's a great point, Sean. That's such a great point. So, and, and it goes to this whole thing of this, like, people unable to say, like, right, that one thing could be worse or th- something could be good, can be not great, but better than something else, right? Like, and that is that you, you hear this with, with, with lefty hardliners in terms of, uh, in terms of the Biden administration or in terms of anything, right? It's like, yep. oh, they're just a bunch of neoliberal, uh, you mm-hmm. know, uh, corporate they're all the same and and that kind of logic is it's lazy it's lazy it's very lazy, it is lazy yeah. you know yeah, because no it point. is far more complicated than that and yes countries do bad things countries do good things but you know what uh when i look at russia's behavior and i look at america's behavior i say to myself I don't know, man. It seems pretty obvious to me. Like we're not straight up. I mean, Trumpism, let Trumpism be Trumpism, but America in the last 100 years or let last 50 years and, and, and Russia in the last 50 years. I don't know. I, I think it seems like a pretty clear decision to me. But hey, I'm biased, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like you just have to recognize the truth of things, right? And not your ideology. It's like I, I tend to, I pretty much would consider myself socialist, not in a mm-hmm. hardcore sense, but I think there's a lot of good things about capitalism. I don't, I, I, I see the good in capitalism as well as, right. as the destructive aspects of it. You know, it's like, you just have to recognize, you have to try to do the best you can and to look at things objectively and dispassionately and be honest mm. with yourself, be willing to admit you're wrong, be, you know, and, and understand how the complexity of it all, you know, Sure, but any anyhow, sure. yeah. um, we could we're going to delve into all, we're, going to, we're going to go off on tangents in this conversation because there's so <laughs> much to talk about. So, but, and that's t- totally cool. I'm glad we are, but at the same time, it's my job to bring it back once in a while. So, like, <laughs> let's fo- refocus back in on the idea of our own natures and our struggles on a personal level to deal with with these crises. And so, I want to ask. I mean, I, what I'm hearing from you guys is that. Part of the big frustration is just people's inability to see what's really going on and believing these delusions that uh, across the board, whether it's from religion or politics, nationalism, whatever it might be, and and, and being and feeling like really impotent about it. Because how do you make have that conversation? It, it is such a learning curve to understanding geopolitics. Yes, or, you know, it, it's just like you can't just like. <laughs> You can just tit for tat back and forth, like true as, you know, these memes, but it goes so much mm-hmm. deeper than that. And that's really frustrating. So what has worked for you guys? Like what, what kind of strategy do you employ to try to keep focus and keep strong and to be able to meet this moment? Well, I think that it, it, it's, it all still goes back to having a basis of knowledge, right? And understanding mm. particularly the history of, you know, from from World War II to the present and what has happened in the international system, understanding what we, what's gone right, what was, you know, uh, and what's been lost. And I think that there's a lot of people who, you know, they just don't have that understanding. They didn't study international relations. They didn't, you know, that they haven't studied history or the law or, or uh, any of the kind of basic things. And so they, kind of want to cling to a simple explanation where there's Mm -hmm. white hats and black hats. And, uh, when they don't, when they see things, they can't make sense of complexity. And so I always try to pull people back to the basics of international institutions of civics, uh, in our government. And I know that I'm not, again, really answering the question because how does this, how do, how do I deal with it? Well, you know, I have people talking to me sometimes about, you know, should I leave the country? Uh, mm. Where would I go? And I'm going, you know, there's nowhere. I, I, I'll come into the conclusion because we we talked about this, you know, when 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 Trump won and at various times when it's gotten crazy, you know, it's like, oh, you know, well, you know, Ecuador is a cheap place to live and it's pretty good. People <laughs> like it. Uh, Thailand, you know, there's Australia, New Zealand, there's Canada, you know, Canada's not looking so good anymore after this craziness right. up there. Uh, they're having some of the same problems we are. So uh, these are various stages of denial because there's yeah. nowhere you can go in the world to be free of worry over the political situation. 
And that's right. That's, you know, that's kind of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I hear that. I hear that. Um, for me, uh, in, in the simplest terms, I approach the challenge of maintaining hope in difficult moments by rejecting black and white thinking, like we're talking about, and shifting my perspective to things that I can personally control, right? So for me, that's met meditation as a tool to learn to modulate my emotional response to difficult events and to develop mental flexibility and to understand systems in a very intrinsic way. Um, and and to get more specific about it, or more specifically, I think black and white thinking is counterproductive for all the reasons we're talking about here. First, because it's very little about humanity fits neatly into one category or another. Certainly the big problems we're facing on the international scale. And second, because I, when I assess the world in binary terms, a sense of hopelessness is the likely result. And again, hopelessness is super disempowering. So look, I think that if I am going to contribute meaningfully to the social justice project, I've got to master the art of switching between the narrow perspective of the day to day and the expansive mm. arc of human evolution. Wow. Then I can stop responding to my inability to solve the world's problems with self-flagellation and paralysis. Because after all, feeling shitty about the state of the world is not the same thing as doing something about the state of the world. No. So it, in that way, I can reclaim the mental space that I need to to identify within myself how I can personally contribute to social justice. And I can reclaim my agency in that way. Uh, I can reallocate my time and my energy in a way that reflects my small role in the drama of human progress, but in a way that is personal personally meaningful like you said uh joe earlier that is that that we can live a life of richness um and service and um it all comes down to being able to hold those two disparate ideas in my head like yes the world is really really shitty yes people are suffering but also uh, i can be happy in this world somehow i can be at least um i'm privileged to be fair Mm -hmm. But I can hopefully hold that idea in my head that, yes, I can do um, right by myself and my family and the people around me. And in effect, again, control what I can control, like in the yeah. moment, which can which not might which might not be much. But I don't have control over the system. You know, uh, the systems and systems slow, change slowly, typically, not always. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because I was just thinking as you were talking about that, Christoph, is that a lot of people might tend to get kind of caught up in a you know, why me? Why now? Why is it, you know, this is the only life we have. This is all we're going to get. So, you know, why does it have to get fucked up now by this craziness that's happening in the world? And, you know, th the response to that is why not me? Why not now? Like right. we are extremely <laughs> lucky, even, even though we're si watching our systems break down and everything else like that, we've had very, very good lives and very, very good opportunities. And mm -hmm. we've also benefited from a very highly advanced civilization where science and technology have been making strides by just leaps and bounds compared to anything mm. that's existed in the past. And I think that, you know, it's a cliche and I, What's the book? Because I'm not, I'm, I, I would say that I'm not literate in terms of fiction very much, but it starts mm. out, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Oh, is I don't that, remember which one it is, but that's one of the, like, is that it's a, a Dickens classic. novel? It's a classic. It's a classic. It might be Dickens. I think it's, I think it is Dickens. You're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that's um, it. We, we get both the, we get the extremes. We're in a, we're in a world of extremes right now where we've got this extreme mm. prosperity and wealth. And then we have this, this just like inexcusable violence and poverty. Yeah. Well, I, it's interesting. What I hear both of you saying in different ways um, is that we we sometimes we just have to pan out and get the bigger view and like just mm -hmm. you know see the larger world and understand things in that at that level. And and the personal always is there and it has to be there because we are human beings, right? Like my shirt. Like <laughs> we we experience the personal we and we're going to. But at the same time the transpersonal or whatever you want, word you want to use, you know, mm -hmm. because there's so many words for this, but the, to be able to, the, the ability to be able to see the larger picture and experience the larger picture, even in some ways, like, and understand where we're at in comparison to history, in comparison to, to sort of geography and, and other mm -hmm. situations and other cultures and so forth. And, and, and to that, I think gives us 
the ability to then say, well, look, maybe things aren't quite as bad as they look. Maybe that this is this has happened before, and we've you know maybe there there there's more options than we realize.、Mm. May, you know maybe things aren't quite as clear as we think. Maybe this is a lot more complexity. You know, and and so it, it opens up the door for hope because if you think the world's totally fucked and that's it. And we're never going to get out of it. We're going to get. We're going to get fascism. We're going to get climate change disasters.、Mm-hmm. We're going. We, if you think that way, it's really enervating, right? It just saps you. It is. And and I think that's what I also try to do when I when I get into that mental space. I try to recognize it first and foremost, and I think that speaks to what you said,、mm. Christoph, about like just whatever method you want to use, whether it's meditation, whatever method you want to use,、sure. you know, yeah, uh, sports, art, whatever it might、mm-hmm. be, but ways to really get yourself out of that mental space where you're、yeah. o- you're you're a little bit more open and, and you're more observant, more aware, and and you're able to then see these things in, rather than just feeling besieged by them. You know?、mm. Yeah, I thought of something else too when you were saying that, and that is. That a lot of the collapse that we're seeing is sort of the collapse of old paradigms, old ways of、mm. doing things. And if, as long as we're looking at, it, it's like, well, you know, if we don't have if we don't have social democrats running countries, then there's no hope. You know, it's just going to be we're just、right. going to go authoritarian. It's just going to be a disaster. And we see this like domino effect happening all around the world. But what if? What we're seeing right now is a kind of a messy transition to a completely new system、mm-hmm. of governance, a completely new, you know, where where maybe things aren't being run by governments. Maybe it is all private actors, and maybe like we we kind of see it like moving toward feudalism. But maybe there's a way where there'll be new systems of accountability that will emerge. Things having to do with with you know automated systems, AI. I don't know. Like I try、mm. to find. Uh, I, I'm always grasping at straws, kind of, to find new systems that might be developing organically. Because right now, it just seems otherwise. According to the old way of looking at things, it seems like a wipeout. So exactly,、yeah. that's a great point, Sean. I think that yeah, is.、Definitely. I think that is a really wise perspective. I think this also speaks, by the way,、uh, to you、uh, when Justine came on. Right, she talked、mm-hmm. a lot about the interregnum period. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm,、um, right, and I think that's sort of like that's a that's I think a hopeful way of looking at this. And right, the what we tell ourselves about our experience is essentially the same thing as our experience. Right? I mean, that is right. It, it, it's it, it, not not in hard world terms, but in terms of how we feel about it, certainly. So、um, I think. That if we're able to click into that perspective from time to time,、um, and that broader perspective that we're talking about, then, like to your point,、uh, um, both of your points actually, right? Then it's not; it doesn't extinguish. It's it, it rekindles hope. I think, right? I think that is that promise of the United Federation of Planets. You said really well earlier, Sean, too. This idea、um, that、uh, right that art and and is something that we can hold on to that gives us hope, etc. And I think that is absolutely right. And so it, when we can do that, then we can get back down into the nitty gritty of the day to day, right? And、um, and hopefully figure out how best we can contribute. But we can get back into the nitty gritty without with 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 just a little bit more perspective. And I. I think that does matter. It doesn't mean it's going to be fun to watch,、uh, to watch discrimination or watch fascism or watch violence. It's not. It's going to、no. fucking suck to do that, and and especially because we are in, as individuals so powerless over it. Like I can't change what happens in Ukraine,、um, but nevertheless, it can give us just at least something to keep us going. You know. Well, and there yeah, are triumphs、yeah. too. There, are, like for example, like we had Trumpism and this horrible, horrible、um, collapse of 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 social justice and open, you know, warfare being declared on social justice from the very highest levels. But then we had, you know, Derek Chauvin being convicted and these、yeah. killers of、uh, Ahmaud Arbery being convicted, and then we had this. Triumphant hip hop show at the Super Bowl, which has never happened before. And That's right. There is there are so many ways in which we've got like the best of times, the worst of times at the same time, and at the same time. <laughs>、yeah. 
Because also think about, um, right, Black Lives Matter movement, the Me mm-hmm. Too movement. Mm-hmm. They just passed all that, right? That just passed the Senate, the law that makes it illegal. And I'm not going to get it perfect, but it makes it illegal essentially for employers to require confidential arbitration, mm-hmm. right? To, to, to require that, that like uh, as a, as a condition of employment. Yeah. That law passed the Senate. And by the way, one of my friends to testified on the, in the Senate and the, cool. um, and, uh, and, and the House on, on, on behalf of the law. But that's a huge deal. It's huge. Like that is, yeah. and that's purely because of the Me Too movement. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that also it was happened, bipartisan, right? Which is a rare thing. And it was bipartisan, which is shocking. Yeah. Shocking. Yeah. You know, we're going to get shocking things, you know, guys. We're, we're going to start, we're going to see things that are going to be very surprising. And we already have in many ways. I think because I think, uh, one thing that you said, Sean, was that change, you know, comes in, you know there, there's a destruction and a creation part of change right and to, mm. to have to have new things sometimes you have to get rid of the old things and the old things are really old and solid right and and they and they're not going to just fall easy there's going to be a lot of pain involved and i think you know in modern times when change is so fast i mean, I, I think one of the things that people don't understand or really don't give much thought to is just how rapid change is now in comparison to all of the rest of human history and beyond. Mm-hmm. Like no, that's things change so fast. Now. Totally. totally. And, and of course, that's going to be disruptive. <laughs> and we got <laughs> right, right. to expect a lot of disruptions, a lot of serious, serious disruptions. Old orders that have been there for thousands of years are, you know, disintegrating before our eyes mm. and they're fighting back. Why wouldn't they be? Right. Right. Uh, right. Why wouldn't there be backlash? Of course, there will be. And, you know, that that's the bigger perspective. And that that goes to what you were saying, what I we were talking about earlier in terms of the question. Anyway, you were talking about it being unprecedented. Is this unprecedented? And in that sense, it is right, because the problems that we are dealing with are global in a way that they weren't in the in, in, in the past True. right like these are huge these are problems as existential problems in terms of the climate sh- climate right like as existential problems and uh so and facebook right things like facebook didn't exist so the technology right. element both like you guys are both saying things change really fucking fast now yeah and that is disruptive like really disruptive even for people who want the change right how many like how many liberals can i think of or moderates can i think of who are like oh i don't know how much i feel about i uh, didn't want to give up their their private health insurance right, right? right. because it's scary <laughs> it's get right so like and 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 suddenly i'm i'm a bit i've been employed um insured through my employer for the last 20 years and then suddenly i'm going to go on this public thing which which right. by the way you know so anyway um yeah i still i still want single payer like that you know i'm not <laughs> i'm not making the, the counter argument <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we, we, we still have a big man picture of history. We, we, yes. we got to get rid of that. It's like we, we, we assign change agents as like the big leaders and they do have, they may certainly make a difference, but man, I'm telling you, technology is really changing the world. It's capitalism, it's technology, it's modernity. It's all of these processes that are radically changing the world, you know, and, and then the rest of us are trying to catch up and, and, and trying to do the right thing. Some of us, and some of us are trying to do the wrong thing, but ultimately we're all responding <laughs> to that. Well, here's what's it's interesting. True. There's something really interesting, and that is that um, I remember reading in about the year 2000, and it was a it was one of the Kurzweil books. I think it was probably Age of Spiritual Machines, and he, you know, he he came up with the law of accelerating returns, and he talked about how you know we're on not only are we on an exponential growth in terms of technology and a lot of other things, but we're on it. We're actually on a double exponential, like like the 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 rate yeah. of growth is going up exponentially. So, um, mm. <clears throat> he made an incredible statement, and that is that there would be more change in the first twenty five years of the twenty first century than there was in the entire twentieth century. And I was thinking, God, how could wh- how could that be? Like that doesn't and now we're 22 years into it and that's a fucking fact he was he was, right. yeah. he was absolutely right on there's been more change right. yeah. than there was in the entire 20th century at so that's many good, levels right. that's bold that is i think that's right yeah what a crazy thing to think of when you think you know you would get used to things being so instantaneous now it's like but when you look back like you said joe most of world history was incredibly slow yeah you know, most of changes you know yeah oh and and yeah. also in our lifetime the three of us during our lifetime mm-hmm. the world population has doubled that's so insane oh yes. doubled 
That is something so, doubled actually for me. Yeah. Well, you think about, you think like, I think I was with 3 billion when we were kids. Now it's eight, wow. right? So, uh, you think about that and it's not, uh, it's not just double the people. It's also double the problems, double the food production, double the, <laughs> you know, uh, everything. Mm-hmm. And so double the pollution and it, mm-hmm. it, it, uh, that has driven more of this than I think people are willing, generally willing to admit. Uh, that's another yeah. great point, I think, especially especially for us liberals, right? Because poor people have babies, right? Mm-hmm. And that's something that we don't want to talk about, right? But that is population is an issue, right? And anyway, that's a whole other conversation, but a whole hey, other show, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, a whole other show. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, speaking of the show, uh, I uh, I asked both of you to watch this film, which I find one of the best films I've ever seen in terms of war mm. and the experience of war. And it's told by the perspective of a woman. It's a woman's perspective in many ways, but it's a human perspective for number one. And, uh, and the film's called For Sama and you both watched it. And can you just tell me your, your initial impressions to start with that? What did you think of this portrayal of war? Um, well, I thought it was, first of all, a super, I watched it with Lindsay, uh, my partner, and it was a really powerful, powerful film. It, it really made it very real and personal because it felt like you were watching a home video in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and it was, and that's not to say it wasn't well done. It was well done, but the 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 footage is just so personal and um you know a couple moments that jumped out to me um as i was writing and i jotted them down and that was watching people walk away from uh from a bomb a uh, crater or whatever carrying their children right and covered in that fine dust mm-hmm. um that that people had on them on 911 and and i thought about that and i was like right you're traumatizing these many th- 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 these people and we thought of that as one of the most devastating days in american history and and people live with this all the time right yeah, for um, years you had and this, years you, all the time for years and years you had this kid talking about cluster bombs he looked like maybe he was 6 and he knows what a cluster bomb is and talked about his friend dying um dying from a cluster bomb i mean this is it's just like wow this you know it's not War is not sexy. It's not cool. It's not badass. It's death and it's suffering and it's disruption and it's traumatizing. And that film, I th- the film was, whew, man, that brought that home. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, I want to say to your audience here that there's no way for us to give you spoilers for this film. We could tell you everything that happened and it wouldn't spoil it. I've seen it like mm. four or five times and every single time it makes me cry. I, 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 yeah. I, it, like the, it's, it's powerful the fourth, fourth time as it was the first time, if not more so. Mm. Well, I, yeah, I second everything both you guys have said. And it was, it was a really, really tough thing to watch. But it was. I was very glad I watched it because I have. I have. I have so many things to say about this. But mm. what I want to start with is the fact that these people are absolutely no different than you and I. Yes, they are the same. I mean, and their country. Even though, like, you think of Syria, and you don't. I mean, I. I. I don't know what most people think about Syria. I went there. I went, you know, when I was about maybe six or seven, I don't remember much about it because it was, we went mm. to a bunch of different places in the, in the Middle East. And uh, I remember being in Damascus and, you know, thinking that it was very different from America and kind of, kind of dirty and backward. And, uh, now that's totally all changed. I mean, even in the middle right. of this war zone, they had like modern medical equipment and ultrasound yeah. and, you know, x-rays and every other possible thing and computers and all of these things. And somehow they managed to keep the electricity on. Like, I don't understand this, like how they were under bombardment that you can't even imagine for six months or more. They destroyed practically every building in that city. And yet there was power. And, yeah. and, and they were continuing to function and they were getting water from somewhere. And, you know, kids were swimming in bomb craters for heaven's sakes. Yeah. It's like, oh. it's just, there's, you can't, as an American, you just can't imagine the deprivation and the devastation. And yet you look at these people and they're wearing normal street clothes. Like we would wear jeans and, yeah. and t-shirts and, and, and sneakers. And, you know, just like they, they look like Americans. They look like, uh, and even the, the woman who made the film, like most of the time she wasn't wearing a hijab and yes, I noticed that too. You, you, you get this factor where 
you kind of think, oh, well, the Middle East, you know, there's all this religious conflict and everything else like that. And these guys wanted nothing to do with that. They were trying to get they had the free Syrian army and they were trying to get ISIS was trying to infiltrate their uh, yeah. resistance movement. And they were trying to get rid of them. And they were just mm-hmm. like, you know, we're just, we just want to take care of our kids. We want to run this hospital. And uh, it was brutal. Yeah. Such great points, Sean. Such great points. That's some, one thing that jumped right out at me, out at me as well. This isn't like watching uh, something about uh, the, the, the mountains of Afghanistan or something like that, right? Where people are living it with the or goat herders and stuff like that. These are cosmopolitan people. They got the same phone that I've got, yep. um, right? It, it, it was it, so that that is what I think really brought it home because I was able to envision myself specifically in those situations, right? I, like, I was, I was thinking myself in my bed, um, and looking at my computer with, and the glare of her computer on her face and then the boom, 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 the bombs, right? And yeah. it, it was, it was hard. It was tough. That was, uh, and like you said, Sean, also, which I thought was really important, the deprivation, that is deprivation that we as Americans are so unaccustomed to. So unaccustomed to, um, that these, we, we live in a country where people don't want to put face masks on, for example, right? Because <laughs> yeah. it changes, it changes their behavior. They have to, they have to change their behavior this much. Right. Um, it's so, yeah, uh, great, great points all around, Sean. Well, when you're One bringing in want- bloody kids into a hospital day after day after day and watching them die and the tragic scenes of these parents who just can't believe that their kids are gone Ugh. and they're having to say goodbye to them and they're being pulled off their bodies. It's just like, Oh my God. And then, and then another scene that really stuck out at me was when they're down to like, it, you know, the, the siege had been going on for months and months and they're down to like their last rice and they pull out this rice and she's making it and there's bugs oh, in it. Oh, yes. And, you know, she says like, this is all we have. And so they dump it in the pot and they cook it. And anyway, you know, because they have to eat yep. the bugs. And exactly. <laughs> I was just thinking to myself, cook it real good, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. Holy shit. One of the things I think that, speak this movie speaks about is exactly that what you both have said about seeing yourself in those folks like that that's Mm -hmm. just like us that the whole notion of the other that whole feeling of alienness Mm. for other people whether it's within our own country or outside our country because it happens within america too like you know with like segregation and and Mm -hmm. like and, and based on race or based on what ethnicity or whatever it might be and but but you travel you meet people and you and that just vanishes you know like this is why one of the things that's so valuable about traveling and yes. getting to know others and like realizing just how human we all are how very much alike we are there may be some external trappings that are different but in the in the most essential ways we are really really alike and i you know syria syria was a modern nation by the time this happened yeah it was it was cosmopolitan yeah. it was you know, technological, it was everything. And these are middle-class people, you know, yes. it's just like, right. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, her, you know, her husband is a doctor and, exactly. and he, and you she's know, a journalist. Yeah. And, and, you know, everybody went to university and, and I mean, and, and here's the other part for Americans that we really have to think about is, And, and again, it just goes right over your head. These people were all speaking English and Syrian yes. and whatever else. You know, they had probably know. try, you know, to try, try or quadlingual, right? Um, because yeah. everybody educated in the world pretty much speaks English as well as right. whatever their yeah, local language common. is. And so these are people who are probably maybe smarter than we are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you, you, both of you are so right. This uh, being able to place ourselves directly in those individual shoes, I think was such an important part of this and uh, just remarkable their commitment. I guess we're going to talk about this a little bit in, in, in a minute, but their, their commitment to, uh, to, to freedom of uh, the, the ideals and to freedom and just their hatred of the regime, as they kept saying, right? Like it's hard for us as Americans to understand what it would be like to live under that kind of, that kind of a totalitarian style system, right? Like an authoritarian system like that. Um, and, and so I was thinking to myself also from that perspective, right? Like, wow, imagine if I, couldn't just leave my house or I couldn't just go or say what I wanted to say. We yeah. we'd say all kinds of, we'd say all kinds of dis, we'd say all kinds of crazy things on this show, not crazy bad, but we say a lot of strong opinions, right? That man, that wouldn't be allowed, right? Maybe I can right. be disappeared. Um, that kind of stuff is something, again, we also take for granted, I think, as Americans. For sure. So I, we could talk so much about this, uh, all the different aspects of this film. I think there's a few things we want to cover, but before we get to the sort of the more details, I just want to sort of bring this back to what the show is about and talk about what 
you guys think are the social consequences for this film? And uh, what lessons can we draw from the way that the protagonist, uh, the woman who filmed and directed this documentary, Wad, uh, and her friends and family persevered in, in these heartbreaking wartime conditions? I mean, they, uh, that's the thing. One of the things that really struck out to me is like how incredibly, uh, like, just you know, determined they were, you know, and mm -hmm. it, despite like the constant, constant disappointments. E extremely determined. And I mean, I know like it's tough to, to make a film. It's tough to make a film no matter what you're doing. And it's, and under, under mm. those conditions to not at some point just go, you know, fuck it. Or maybe the camera gets destroyed by a bomb or, you know, like the fact that she kept this camera safe, she was able to keep the batteries charged. She was able to get tape, uh, all the, all the different <laughs> things that you have to think about when you're, when you're shooting a film and to keep it going in the face of these brutal scenes. I mean, one of the scenes, you know, th she's filming when the, a bomb goes off. Yeah. Right. During when, you know, yeah. and, and then the guys are going in, they're warming their hands on the bomb because it's freezing. You're not thinking about that. You're <laughs> thinking, like, you know, like these guys are trying to keep warm. They have no heat. Right. And they're trying to run a hospital <laughs> and, and, and they're grateful because the bomb is warm. Right. The, the yeah. shrapnel that just came in and could have killed them. Right. It's just, yeah. it's, it's so many mind boggling things about it from every perspective. And, um, and then at the end, at the end, you know, they're trying to get, get through these checkpoints and to think that she could have lost all that footage in, you know, just, mm -hmm. a, a, just a split second that she had been putting together for years. That's, I, I think she would probably have rather died than lose her footage, you know, and that's the mm -hmm. mark of a true documentary filmmaker. <laughs> totally. you know, that's, that's, that's the thing. Um, I remember there, remember the 2004, uh, uh, tsunami that hit, uh, you know, uh, yes, the East Indies, in particular India. Mm -hmm. and, and people will say, we're seeing all this footage, but nobody was showing the footage of where the wave was the, the biggest, like the tallest, because nothing survived. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Nobody could film it. Right. Like, right. Nobody and, could and so this is, this is that, that luminal space, right, where this woman was able to have just enough resources to film this, that it wasn't absolute devastation, but slightly more, and she wouldn't have been able to. You know, and I think yeah. that's what we see. This is the only thing we can see. We actually don't get to see the worst of the worst, <laughs> you no, know, well, for that. Totally. I, I, I changed my perspective because of this film in the sense that I remember, I mean, I, I remember going all the way back to 2012 when the news first broke that uh, Assad had fired into a crowd of demonstrators and killed a thousand people. Yeah. You think about, mm -hmm. you think about what that Which means. It's just insane. Where, yeah. yeah. That's insane. You have demonstrators like in this country, you know, one person dies and it's national news, right? But he killed a thousand <sighs> people firing live ammunition into a crowd. And that's what sort of kicked off this thing. And the reason he did it is because people were coming in from the countryside because they couldn't farm. Climate change right. kicked off the Syrian war. Wow. They couldn't interesting. Farm, and so they were coming into the cities. There was no work and they were threatening the regime and uh, the regime was being extremely oppressive. So I actually went to a demonstration in 2012 in San Diego where they had a bunch of people who were trying to raise uh, public awareness and they were they had free Syrian army banners. And I remember at that time that a lot of people on my Facebook feed and a lot of friends that I knew were saying things like, oh, you know, uh, like they were against the idea of the U.S. giving any help to these people because it was like mm. not another Vietnam, not another Iraq, not another Afghanistan, you know, no more war. I'm already against the next war and all these things. And I'm like going, no, you don't understand. These are secular liberals just like you and me. And yeah. they need help right now. And and the U.S. wasn't wasn't going to do it. Um, and we didn't do yeah. it. And <laughs> Great yeah. points. Really, really great yeah. points. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think one of the things you said was uh, talking about climate change as people think of climate change as, oh, it's going to get warmer, um, but not that it will or that even I may have to move my house or this X and Y and Z is going to flood. But they don't think of it in terms of what it how it'll kick off um, humanitarian disasters, but 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 uh, but destabilize countries right because just for what you're saying right they come in from this from the from the um from the countryside because there's no work out there because of climate change so um it's it being able to connect those dots and funny enough that goes back to what we were saying in the beginning 
a lot of one of the frustrating things is that folks are unable or unwilling to connect those kinds of dots. And so not understanding and don't really understand. I think one of the things that really struck me in the film and we've talked about it a lot is just just how remark- remarkable it is that they were able to keep their spirits up. Right. And um I think it was a testament in being in, in discipline and in focus. But I think that, you know, one of the things and maybe maybe one of the reasons why they're able to do that was because they were able to do what we talked about, which is able to like to go out to the broader perspective. Right. They were fighting for freedom. They were fighting for their children. There was one point in which they even the woman even said, I don't remember exactly what she said, but she said something along the lines of even if it's not for me. Mm-hmm. Right. Even if it's not for me, it's for the next generation. Right. Um, and I've, I've been reading. um uh I've been, I, you know, I've been rereading the uh, uh, pri- the systems book, the primer, uh, a primer on systems, mm-hmm. and I think one of the things she said toward the end was that uh, Native Americans would think for the seventh generation down the road, that's how they would plan yeah. for plan today, yeah. and uh, that, and and so we should be doing that, obviously, but um, but also in terms of this woman getting through that incredibly trying time, right? Uh, you know, perhaps thinking to herself how maybe she could did it by thinking to herself, hey, look, you know, I might not make it, but the kid, my my daughter will make it. And she wrote and she made the movie for her daughter. Right. So um, that's kind of a depressing way to think about it, obviously. But uh, but I do think that that was something that was remarkable that they were able to do that, to maintain that hope and that commitment to the idea of freedom uh, throughout all of that just complete shit show. Yeah, yeah. Very, 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 very much so. And especially I was thinking about this with the children and remember the one kid who he was crying because his friends left. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And you think about that. He would rather stay in a war zone to defend his city than, you know, he's looking down on his friends who've left the, you know, to save their lives. Right. Right. And, 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 and the same thing happened with the adults. They went to visit their like grandparents or whatever. And then they came back. Like into yes, back, they into, came back. They snuck back into the war zone through the front lines to get back to the hospital so they could keep saving lives. It's bringing just, their baby with them. Americans yeah. have no concept of yeah. that kind of risk taking. No, no, and 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 to our your point, Sean, these aren't people who have been living under these circumstances forever, right? Like this was new for them too. They lived in yes. a city and lived a, and lived a life, right? And then all of a sudden, this was their life. Um, mm-hmm. so we, we so it was I, just unbelievable. Like it 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 was a film that did a great job of putting you, making you ask the question of yourself, uh, what would I do? in those exact same situations. Would I sneak back into the city? Right. Um, would I have stayed? Would I have just completely lost it? I mean, emotionally and mentally, uh, definite, de- definite possibility, <laughs> yeah, but, well, I, um, <laughs> but it's remarkable. You know, those of us who are spoiled, those of us who are, who, who are used to a first world, um, peaceful, prosperous mm-hmm. lifestyle, I think would have the hardest time with this. And I think we would do what yes. we have to do like everybody in wartime does. But I was also True. thinking about this in terms of the immigration situation at our Southern border, because I know for a yes. fact that there are people who come a sneak into the U S illegally, they work here for years and then they have to sneak back out to go visit their relatives. And then they sneak back in to the country. And that's right. kind of what it reminded right. me of. And that's just life for them. And Right. You know, so, yeah, my feeling about it is, you know, even if these times, if 2020, 2021, 2022 turns out to be like things we wish for in, in 10 years from now, yes. right? Oh, things God, get what that a depressing bad, right? thought. Yeah. Right. I think we need to understand how, what we're capable of. Like these people, which is regular, normal people like us, and they just rose to the occasion and they, they adapted. And I think that we are all capable of adapting and rising to the occasion. Whether or not we will is another question, but we're capable of it. And I think that we need to think about the strategies and the, and the ways of life to help us do that, to, to get us in that spirit. Because we we may not have a choice. We may have to deal with, with a lot of adversity coming, but we can deal with it. And we can overcome a lot of it. We can survive. We can even find some measure of happiness in it, all that. Uh, hopefully it won't get <laughs> that bad. And yeah, maybe it so. won't. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> making any predictions, but I mean, like just to think that we can deal with it, whatever comes, we'll, we can deal with it. 
You know, that's also, a, I think, hopeful. I don't want to wish that is hopeful. any ill on our country, but uh, I have to say that the attitude of these people in wartime was way better than the attitude of most average Americans who won't put on a fucking mask, right? And if you think Definitely. about it, some, a little <laughs> adversity might actually be good for the American character. Not that I want mm. any of these things to happen, but learning to deal with, you know, not having water or power for an extended period of time or uh, being under some sort of in, in, in wartime conditions, like it changes a whole generation of people. And I think totally. in the U S like the, the, you know, the greatest generation, um, you know, I don't know too many of those people, but they were all very hardworking, dedicated citizens. And they didn't have this entitlement mentality that you, that you get from a lot of boomers. Mm, yeah, it, that's a, it's a that's a great point, Sean. I really do think that it, it builds character. I, adversity builds character. I, I think that is a true statement. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily build character, though. Right. It's uh, it, but that is that is, I think, the real challenge we all face here. Right. Is how do we respond to the adversity? Do we take it, lean into it and find ways to not only get through it because like we're saying most people people will people will persevere but how do we take the things that happen in our lives the feelings that we have the thoughts that we have all the way up to the the, the real sort of societal problems we have how do we take that and convert that into something positive for ourselves let me use an example so uh right i i i've used to say a lot, uh, not so much anymore, but I think it's still true, is that being black develops character, right? Because you have to find a way to survive in an environment that is in, in many ways hostile. And that cha that causes, that causes me to evolve mm -hmm. to meet that, to meet that, right? Um, it's a creative destruction sort of process. And I think I just used that out of, pulled that out of a hat, but I think that's true of anything. Think of the, the, the kids who, uh, kids, kids who have cancer. Right. These kids often come out the other side of that if they survive it like really different people. Mm -hmm. Right. They have they have a perspective that is remarkable. Um, they look there. They seem older for their age. Um, they seem wiser uh, than they should be for their age. And I think that if we can take the problems that we're facing and not not minimize them because they are fucking real and they are fucking dire. But if we can take them and 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 find ways to evolve to meet those challenges, I think that is, that is, even if it doesn't actually do much of anything, what it does do, it gives you a sense of agency. I'm doing something, mm -hmm. right? That's um, important. And, uh, and, and that's hard. And, and I don't even know exactly what that means, but that's, that's hard. Um, but, uh, but I, but as I think about this more and more, and, uh, and, and I think this is a really great analogy, Joe. I'm really glad you used this show to talk about this, I, th this movie to talk about this idea because, it, it first of all, it puts our problems into perspective, but second of all, it 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 really the two issues of of dealing with that a kind of adversity and deciding what you're going to do in the face of that adversity is is the challenge. I think is a good way of talking about it. Yeah, I think one of those strategies, like well said, one of those strategies is finding that solidarity in others. I mean, in the movie, you mm -hmm. can see that you like people totally. relied on each other and supported each other, and they understood each other like that's the other thing like they understood the suffering and the struggles i mean the the civil rights model right you know was is a great model like the people it was community based it was grassroots it was like support mm -hmm. and it was you know you had your leaders like martin luther king but you had massive amount of energy behind them, right? And, and right. it's just like, you know, these church ladies, you know, they did so much work, you know, in the background, you know, it's just like, yeah. and, and, and I think that that's a part of it. I think we can learn to persevere if in part we assist each other with it, mm. like, and, and, and are open to that. And I think in America, we were very alienated, isolated from each other. It was very atomized. You know, a culture does mm -hmm. that to us. And we do, sure. obviously we have friends, obviously we have community and all that. But when it comes to like political stuff, there's actually really discouraging to have solidarity and community in this country. And this is fundamentally political, right? Surviving in the sure. war is like, and, and, and that whole film, I mean, there's a, there's a strong political sense of like, of a strength that comes from that, right? You have a cause. Your friends and community help with you. You're suffering, not alone, but with others. 
um, and you're finding ways to persevere with others. And I, I think we can redevelop that in, in our mm. nation. I, I think that you know, we have models we can use for that too. One of the things that was really important that uh, th along those lines in the film was the importance of play. And hmm. there was there was multiple scenes where th they're doing these things that seem just completely mundane. Yes. And, and yet yes. they were so important to their resilience and to their survival, even like, you know, the kids, he's building a pirate ship out of paper and tape. Right. Like, I don't even like, mm -hmm. again, I, ha I have a, a real struggle understanding how these guys got the supplies, medical supplies, and even, you know, paper and pencils and things mm -hmm. that they needed while they were under siege, you know, or like they had watercolor paints and they went out to a bus that had been bombed and you see them painting the bus yes. yellow and green and purple and different colors. And, and, and this give, gave the kids a sense of hope. And if you didn't know there was a war on, like the sun was out and they were playing in this bus mm -hmm. and the kid was pretending he was driving, even though there was nothing there, it was just, um, that really, uh, I, I bet you that if you went back to the European sieges that happened during World War II, that probably some of the same things were going on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Great point. Well, I think part of the answer, uh, Sean, is that Aleppo w lost most of its population. So most everyone left. And whoever, and they left the resources there, you know, the tape mm. and, and the film cartridges mm. and all that. Yeah. That's probably part of it. Including the electricity, all of a sudden you only have to provide electricity to twenty percent of the population versus eighty percent or hundred percent, whatever it was before. <laughs> right, I don't know. Right. I'm just guessing. I, I, I yeah, could be yeah, wrong, yeah. but it was just really a, a, well, an fact, odd just, juxtaposition because I also remember watching on the news it was. in 2016, 2017, and just saying and just like, oh my god, Aleppo is fucked, right? I mean, I can remember yeah. saying that over and over again. I mean, day after day after day, just the city in just complete and total ruins, and now to come back you know, and see this film, you know, five or seven years later, uh, of what was actually going on, that there were, that there were real people underneath all of those explosions and that they were surviving. It's just, it's one of the strangest things I've ever experienced. Mm. And, and I think that that's important that we never get into a place where we let ourselves say, oh yeah, those people are fucked. Right. Yeah. Right. Great point. That's a really good, yeah. you know, I, I was at a point too, Sean, where I was like, when people, when things were bad or I had a bad feeling or someone said something was complaining, I would say, well, Hey, at least you're not in Aleppo. Right. right. Because I washed on to, cause I literally yeah. was saying mm -hmm. that, right. Because it was, cause it was so obvious how bad it was. But to your point, Sean, it's, it's interesting that it's interesting to not, I look, I can look back at Holocaust, uh, you know, uh, coverage and videos and all that kind of stuff, but it's so far away that it feels very, that it feels, uh, it feels like history. Um, but this only five to seven years ago, like that is really unsettling in a different way. I, it's unsettling in a different way. You're like, holy shit, these people are in my lifetime, they, in my generation, and they are suffering like they that. They put up a date and I'd go, I remember what I was doing on that date, you know, or around exactly. that time, right? Exactly. I, this is, exactly. oh, I was doing yep. this, I was doing that, and thinking about the fact, and probably right now while we're actually having this taping, um, there are similar circumstances going on. I mean, we saw a kindergarten got shelled in, in, in Ukraine yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to shift to that topic uh, to kind of close off a little bit here. How does this apply to what we're, you know, we're seeing the, the war drums again. We're seeing this, this happening in the Ukraine with Russia. Again, Russia, you know, we have to talk a little bit about that as well. Like why they involved again, right? They're, they're complacent. They're complicit in what happened in oh, Syria yeah. big time. And we, we don't want to let them off the hook. Right. Um, yeah. I, you know, when ultimately when it comes right down to it, we can talk about the politics and the geopolitics forever, but we're talking about the destruction of cities, right? Humans, people suffering, dying, uh, you know, in horrible, horrible ways. And that should be the first and foremost in everyone's mind, not this bullshit about, you know, do you, you know, well, you know, United States did it too. So we can do, do we should let, oh. we should understand that Russia has a uh, excuse to do this again. Like, right. No, you don't, nobody has the right to bomb civilians, particularly hospitals and schools. Like they, they do st strategically to sow terror. They, and that they is just to break their will. I mean, they just, it's yeah, intentional. No, and, and this is where I really have a bone to pick with the left because, uh, the left is against mm. war no matter what. 
And, Mm -hmm. um, would you let somebody come into your house and shoot you or would you defend yourself? And this is where a lot of people on the left really don't think things through because they're not thinking these are human beings there. And they're just thinking, oh, well, we don't want to get involved. And it's like, what if it was your house? What if it was you? Yeah. What if it was your kid mm-hmm. in this situation? And um, yeah. it's not that simple to just be anti-war. If you say you're already against the next Agreed. war, you're, you you might as well just be, you know, you're just a, a, a fascist sympathizer as far as I'm concerned, because you don't I, even know what I, the war is about. I 100% about. agree with you. One hundred percent agree with you, Sean. This idea of just the just reflexive rejection of the use of force. Um, as I always say, like I, I I think, as you know, I'm a big Obama fan, but I think that Obama uh, in Syria was a complete disaster. But I think just in general, the Obama doctrine was use force sparingly, but use it mm-hmm. right. Yeah. It, it wasn't this sort of like Pollyanna. A lot of Pollyanna in this show. <laughs> it wasn't this Pollyanna ish um, uh, uh, sort of. Um, uh, just a realistic assessment of when force is necessary. Um, I wonder too, and more on the broader scale, does the United States, the United States learned lessons in Vietnam. And so they fought the Gulf war very differently. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, and, and I wonder like you fought in Syria and you lost basically Syria, right? How do you, do you go into Ukraine thinking a little bit differently about this? I don't know. Um, But again, all of that stuff, distracts from the fact that there are real people there and that has to be that has to be like really central in the calculus here of how anyone responds to this both as us as observers but as, as especially people who are actors in it you know well we have yeah. a friend of the show whose name is uh, David Dodson and he's a film director and he mm-hmm. actually made a film just a few years ago where the current president of the of Ukraine starred in this film Right. I mean, this is this hmm. is like real life stuff. And so wow. and he's married to a Ukrainian. And hmm. so his family, his his wife's family is now currently today under threat. Right. And so wow. this is very, very close wow. to home. Uh, mm-hmm. Ukraine is a country of 44 million people. They're Europeans. It's a modern country. Um, yep. And anything that happens there, like if they go in with a full scale invasion, we're going to see. uh similar things happen as what we saw in that film. And it's going yeah, to be, definitely. I just read today. I don't know if this is true or not, but they said that if, if, if there's an invasion, they're going to evacuate all 3 million people out of Kiev. Wow. wow. Now that is a logistics operation. Holy shit. Well, I mean, modern weapons is just so incredibly destructive, oh, you know? So true. And, and, and we, and always in retrospect, we look back and say, well, maybe we should have like, Bill Clinton, he said, you know, he claims <laughs> right, that right. his biggest mistake was not getting involved in Rwanda yeah. with that genocide, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which has, you know, almost a million people were, were slaughtered and just, you know, in the, in the worst ways. And the United States could have maybe minimized that. They could have probably prevented it even, but didn't. And, you know, like, and yes, that would have cost some American lives for sure. I don't doubt it. But I mean, I think we have to understand that we are one human family. And these nationalistic, the resistance to helping each other, I think we just can't afford to do that anymore. And I don't think it's an Mm. ethical thing to do. Well, you know what I thought? Um, Because of this constant tension about, you know, are we going to intervene? Are we not going to intervene? And the left always, it used to be the left would always come down on the side of not intervening and the right would want to intervene. And now it's like kind of the opposite. You got the isolationist right. True. And um, I I have always thought that these types of interventions should be routinized. They should be put under the auspices of the UN. They should be automatic whenever uh, Mm -hmm. civilian lives are threatened, because that was what was going through my head this entire time watching the documentary. It's like, don't know, don't bomb. There's children in there. You know, like, like if if there's a situation where you, where you know that there are people in harm's way, I mean, the, the world has to act. I don't know how it can not act. I I was just going to say quickly that she said that at the beginning of the film, right? She was like, we were sure that the world would respond, right? That that's what she said. I remember her saying that and the world, well, didn't. Um, no. And that that goes to a lot of the breakdowns of the systems we were talking about before. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. Well, I think you do. You respond 
with with strength you do it wisely you you don't just rush in you try to do what you can first diplomatically and sanctions and getting a coalition going and all that which is all right to do but at times you do need to use force and yeah. for the it's for the greater good and it, and the only not only does it I mean, if you if we did it systematically as you say sean if we had a system then that itself would prevent a lot so, yeah mm -hmm. right so we just the have existence to... of the system yeah right? i mean that's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the whole point of deterrence all of the power axes in the world whether it's china or russia or the u.s none of them want to surrender that kind of control or sovereignty no, to an international that's body right. they just don't and so they feel they still they want to use war as a tool of of expansion of oppression of whatever for their own ends and and we know damn well that uh Putin has never been happy with Ukraine being an independent country. He considers it oh, part of Russia. No, mm -hmm. so that's right. That's right. No, and and uh, you know it has implications for all of us. We, if this war does happen, and it looks like it might, it's not. It's not looking very good right now. It's going to have geopolitical global consequences to all of us too. Yeah, including probably going to make inflation even worse for one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sure. going to. Uh, divert a lot of resources it's going to cause political strife here in this country even more than we have oh it's going yeah to confuse the situation we have so many other problems that we have to deal with and this is going to be take off take take all the oxygen you know and, so and that's just it's well and one of the things that's happened in ukraine is since it got out uh, from underneath the soviet union it's established a bunch of independent industries and if they do go to war we're about to find out what they make because we didn't know up until now, right? Because <laughs> we won't. Yes. Well, all of a sudden, we won't have those yeah. things. Or well, they'll be very expensive. Yeah, you know, or <laughs> well, they'll be very expensive. A good point. Um, a good point. There's a lot of Ukrainians. Just you know, in my life, peripherally, uh, you know, people who are at least some way connected to the Ukraine. So this is is very. It's like you say, Sean. It feels very personal. I think it feels like right in our backyard, and it feels like here we are on the precipice of a new potential disaster and it's like you know like what do, what, what are we going to do as a country uh, and like you said joe it doesn't look good it doesn't look good and people are definitely going to die and people are definitely going to suffer like that's definitely going to happen and of course you know the right's going to make political hay out of it oh of course to, yeah to try to to try to to discredit biden and so we're going to have a very broken front here instead of a united front <sighs> and it's just going to be a mess a total mess well, and you know that like um, Biden is standing for democracy and the Republican Party isn't like basically the Republican Party and <laughs> right. Putin are on the same side. Right. So right. it's like, That's right. but then they'll also use it to make hay uh, against Biden that Biden was weak or whatever the fuck. It's just it's such a yeah. like we are really playing a very bad hand right now as Democrats. <laughs> yes, we really are. And we have been for quite some time. Yes. So um, ultimately, what to bring it back again is we have these crises. This war is one of them. Climate change is always there, always, you know, no matter what else happens. That's the, the sort of like, you know, the, the global cry, you know, the, the dark cloud that's over us all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, the, the decline of democracy globally, not just in this country, but all, all over the world. And authoritarianism is on the rise. We have, uh, you know, uh, cyber warfare and social media craziness and, you know, the pandemic, you know, the, the, there's so much going on. And any one of these things is going to affect us, right? Yep. And so here we are as regular people trying to do what we can to make it, to do our part. And like, and like you said, Christoph, it's hard because these problems are so big and we're so small and we can't really do much. We can't, there's not much we can do directly to solve any of this stuff. But what we can do is continue to uh, raise awareness and then come up with strategies to to be able and share those strategies about how to how to persevere and how to make a difference. And if we certainly if we're the only ones doing it, we're totally fucked and out of luck. But we're not, <laughs> right? There's so right. many others doing the same thing all over the world, and so we're joining this community community of support to try to make the world a better place. And and that in itself is very hopeful that we have that avenue. It's not a hopeless avenue. It's not a waste of time at all. 
Yeah. Well, and I think if there's any way to provide any kind of humanitarian or material support, like if, if they do get attacked, I think, um, I wasn't at all involved in any of the Syrian relief efforts, but I wish I was after having seen this film. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and if there's anything, you know, we should try to find out, I guess, <laughs> what, how we can help the people in Ukraine. Because I've been hearing, actually, that people have been able to get uh, cryptocurrency through, whereas there's, oh, it's, it, it's very hard to get any sort of donations through, but crypto works, and they've been getting uh, aid through that way. So that's something we got to look into. Yeah, we should definitely look into that. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that we can do um, and we should continue to do is continue to point out this is something we can do as individuals, as little people is um, is continue to point out the system that we're all living in. Right. Because it's hard to know the systems you're living in and under when you're in them. And a lot of folks don't think about think about it that way. And I think that if we, um, right, if we, it is important to, like you said, uh, raise awareness of what's going on, why it's happening. And even if, and, and I like to think of it this way, you know, I can't impact what's going to happen in Ukraine, but I can impact and I can't impact what most people think about what's happening in, in the Ukraine, but I, in Ukraine, but I can affect the people that are in my life, that are around me, that are within my social media, uh, uh, reach. Um, and, and to your point, Sean, I can also do material, you know, whether it be a donation or whether it be, uh, whatever kind of relief effort I could do. And I do, and I think that when we look at problems in terms of what we can, and as I've been saying this all episode, but if we, when we look at problems in terms of, um, what we can actually do, what is under our control, even if it's just a little bit, I really think that helps alleviate the sense of hopelessness. Um, yes. And uh, and and I think that's really, really important, especially for those of us, all of us here and those who are listening to this podcast, are people who really care about social justice and care about human suffering and reducing human suffering. So um, right. those are like my little, that's what I think we ought to be doing. And it's not easy. And it's a day and it can be a slog, but but we can do it. And and the community and the solidarity you're talking about right there, Joe, is so fucking critical in that way. And uh, and one of the beautiful things about modernity is that we can communicate with each other. Like, right. The three of us have never right. actually been in the same room together. No. Right. right. Um, but we but we talk to each other every single week. Right. That's community. Right. That yeah. matters. That matters. Right. And and uh, and and it makes me feel it makes me feel that um, I'm doing something. Yeah, me too. And, and we, we look at the importance of this sort of thing is that, you know, the, the, uh, Hamza, the doctor in this film was regularly doing Skype interviews and getting out information from, uh, Aleppo to the world. And I think that that, you know, that we might not have ever had that information if it weren't for that technology and the availability of, of being able to, you know, to get video in and out of a war zone. Sure. Sure. And people might think that, well, they didn't really do much, but I mean, imagine if those things didn't happen, how much worse it would be. Like the fact that the message gets out about the brutality of war checks war. It keeps it from being worse than it is. It does. Well, and as far as I'm concerned, this, the Russians have like a huge black eye, like watching those Russian planes and helicopters just relentlessly pounding that city. You know, it was, it, the The barrel bombs. Yeah. There, there were, there was no, no one in that city was fighting. There was no, no reason for them to, to be dropping those <laughs> no, bombs right. except to just utterly destroy the place. Well, and uh, the Assad regime would have fallen without the Russians. They would have left. They would have. It would have been over. Totally. Yep. There's no yep. question about it. And yep. and you know it, that's is a regime that used chemical weapons against their own people. So, but once again, war was used to suppress democracy, right? Because the people yeah. clearly mm-hmm. did not want that regime. That's right. That's right. Well, gentlemen, any closing thoughts? I think I've said oh, it all. Just my, yeah, I've said it all. My normal thing is just like, you know, I enjoy having these conversations with you guys, even if we are talking about things that are really heavy. And um, and there is hope in community and there's hope in solidarity. And I think uh, in the broadest terms, there's hope in being able to change one's perspective. So if there's anybody out there who's thinking about how to feel better, find ways to change your perspective, even if that's just watching a movie. But, uh, but I think that a lot of the things that we've been talking about today are, are, can help in that way. Yep. Appreciate both of yeah. you. Same here. And Same. guess what? We all need each other to feel better. 
Well, I, I, everybody who's watching this show and listening feel better, damn it, because we need your strength. <laughs> we all, and, That's and right. you need our strength. And that, and the one way to do that, one way to be strong and to be effective is to have a good life and to find those moments of celebration despite mm -hmm. all the bullshit. And so that's part of it, you know, and, and we'll just persevere. We all will. That's what it's all about. Thank you both for having this discussion with me. I hope it was beneficial to you and to all of our listeners. In the end, we're all, like we said, we're all in this together and we would like the, sec the Radical Secular to be a place of learning and cultivating cri critical awareness to be sure, but also one of support and mutual aid. And perhaps this is the way we'll all get through this after all. I'm Joe Okifinti. Thank you for being here. And remember, wherever you are, you can be radically secular. The Radical Secular Podcast is written and produced by Christoph Defoe, Sean Prophet, and Joe Okifinti. Logo and main title design by Tim Stetner. Post-production and original theme music by Sean Prophet. Special thanks to our support team, Lindsay Brightman, Jillian Sky Jacobs, and Lori Field Okipinti. <laughs> <laughs>